So, uh, this is uh, Ben Cole, who's the uh, general manager of uh, Gem Energy. And uh, you may pick up from the accent, he uh, is uh, from, um, from Bavaria. And he's also, as well as being the general manager of uh, Gem, is also a qualified chef, which really comes in handy for Barbies at home. We should have had him cooking the sausages tonight. No, <laughs> no. I, did, I did not reveal that fact until after the sausages had been cooked. <laughs> Anyway, so I'll let, I'll let Ben do the talking and, uh, and uh, take us through this uh, uh, info on uh, batteries and solar power and um, I think we've even slipped a bit about the Tesla in there, haven't you? Okay, yes. right. Okay, how are you, Ben? I've got about uh, 29 slides which uh, contain information around uh, technology changes and um, just interesting facts which are out in the industry at the moment. I'll go through them uh, reasonably quick and then you can go back and if you've got uh, questions about it. On the first um, graph here, that shows you um, how solar PV cell efficiency has developed over the years. However, what you see here, they are um, records, but it's not uh, essentially what's actually out in the consumer market. In the consumer market, we see around 20 to 22% efficiency at the moment. Um, and if you look at the graph, some of the uh, lab records, they go up to 47%, but that, that's not um, sustainable in a, um, in a consumer product. Uh, what we see in the consumer market is around um, the range um, down here. And um, if we look back into the 2000s, um, the, the line is actually the, the new technologies which um, come into effect and um, obviously go a lot further. Are all those silicon salt there? Um, there are different te uh, technologies. We've got um, crystalline cells, then we've got um, single junction and multi junction. I've got some photos of how their panels look like. Um, we also got a thin film. The thin film was always um, a lot less efficient. Thin film are the panels which uh, I think uh, Kodak uh, was the first company that actually printed the thin film solar panels. Um, and they were really low efficiency, however, they came up um, to about 23% as well. Again, that's just a record, it's not a consumer product. Uh, the multi crystalline cells would be. That's the ones uh, we most often uh, see in supermarkets these days. That graph shows us what's actually out in the market right now. Different brands, uh, different um, panel voltages and um, the efficiency. It is around between 20 to 22 percent. Uh, doesn't, doesn't necessarily matter what brand of panels you go with. The difference in price would be um, the actual quality of the panel and how long it actually lasts if you stop with anything. If you uh, don't spend much on it, you can't expect that it actually lasts for long. Um, that's actually just background information, it's a brand. Where is it? So it's not actually one that is one brand where, uh, which is actually made in Australia in um, in Melbourne and Adelaide they got factories. Mm -hmm. okay. That's the graph where we can see um, different um, uh, cell types or, or panel types. Um, Polyperg means that um, there are contacts on the back as well, or perg in general means there are contacts on the front and the back, and because there are contacts on the back, that even there is a white sheet on the back, they still absorb some energy from the back, which means they're slightly more efficient. Um, the poly cells are still blue, mono cells are usually still a uh, darker color. What uh, we see a lot more these days is the, uh, the shingle cells, where they literally tuck up the cells very close to each other. And, um, Uh, where they tuck uh, the cells very close to each other to um, reduce 
the amount of uh, white spice, which means that you can actually make the panel more efficient overall. Um, so, that won't show here, and uh, that won't show there. Um, we also have half cut sizes, right? so going to that in, a, um, in the next slide. And uh, we've got uh, M-type cells, which have no contacts uh, on the front side at all. They look very, very good, a uh, bit more expensive, but also a bit more efficient because they can get up to 23. Um, <coughs> you willing to pay for that. Uh, in regards to the size, um, even that module, which is already one of the older ones, uh, is big. I think the um, 80 and 90, 120 watt uh, panels from um, EP in the, in the past, I think they were about 1.6 by um, 800 millibyte. Then for a very long time, 1 by 1.7 was um, the standard, which was also fairly easy to actually install on a roof if you mentioned you need to carry the panel up a ladder. Then um, people wanted higher power modules, even the cell efficiency didn't grow, or it at least didn't grow that much. Um, to get higher wattage panels, the only uh, way to do that is by actually increasing the size. Uh, a lot of modules are now uh, 1 by 2.1 meter, which um, makes it quite hard to get it up on a roof. And for commercial uh, systems, we also got even, even bigger modules. Uh, we did install 450 watt modules ourselves. I have not yet seen a 560 or 600 watt module uh, myself, but that would definitely need uh, two people to carry it. And I can only mention it's going to be efficient on, on solar farms where you can actually just lift it up onto the rack uh, from the ground. So on a residential and uh, small commercial space, you've got that three modules. Um, for about uh, two years now, we see um, half-cut cells. And um, they're actually uh, very good because uh, a normal solar cell works in a way that uh, the current flows through the whole solar panel. However, if part of the module is shaded, then the output of the, uh, of the whole panel is usually reduced to nearly zero. Right? It only goes through half the panel. If half the panel is shaded, then the other half still, still functions. Yeah. Obviously, you need to install the module in a way so the shade, for example, comes from the bottom up. If the panel would be in landscape and the shade would hit both, uh, both sections, there will be pointless again, uh, the half cut cell wouldn't do, wouldn't do anything. <coughs> so that, that works actually very well if you have um, a tilt system, because when the, if you don't have enough space and you need to put it closer together, then early in the morning the front of the panel is usually shaded, because the, the, first, the panel in front of it will shade the bottom part of the next panel. If the sun rises, then obviously the whole panel will be in the sun. And uh, that's an application where half cut cells um, make really a lot of sense. Um, very interesting are also um, so called bifacial solar panels. Uh, bifacial solar panels have um, glass on the front and the back. They can have an aluminium frame, but there are also uh, modules out there which are really just glass and glass. Um, the good thing here is that uh, together, if they got, again, the perk, which has the, the bus bars on the front and the back, through um, uh, ground reflection, they can actually pick up between 20, uh, sorry, between 10 to 30 percent more energy. Uh, we've got uh, assistance out there ourselves, and it is true they make a lot more energy yeah. out of the cell, out of the sun module, and maybe not so much in Australia, I guess, but if you if you don't have enough spice, you really want to make the most out of the, the spice, and if you install that type of panel, you can pick up the ground reflection and get more out of the sun square meter, essentially. Um, that specific system is also on, on a tracker, so it um, follows the sun. What uh, with the ground reflection, 
it doesn't necessarily need to be on a tracking system on a solar farm. It also would work on a, on a residential system. If you would put it, if you've got a white flat roof and you would put up glass and glass panels on a, on a tilt system, then you would also pick up the reflection from the white roof. If your roof would be black, then obviously black would uh, absorb a lot more of the, of the radiation. It wouldn't work as well, so you really want a white or a light colored ground, which is ideally reflective. Um, in that case here, like light uh, soil or white, white gravel would be good. Um, that was about solar panels. Um, and I want to uh, go through uh, a little bit of um, battery and um, solar inverters. Um, obviously, um, home energy storage has taken off uh, the past over the past year. There was a Queensland um, government scheme which uh, crowded, I think, 5,000 households to get um, solar PV and battery storage. I do believe they will have another round coming up as well at some, some point in the future. I don't think there's a date yet. Um, and through the next couple of slides, I explain to you what the benefits actually are and what battery storage can actually do. Um, to get started, we've got uh, the two distinct systems. They are so-called AC coupled systems and then the um, DC coupled systems. Um, both systems have um, their place, I guess. Um, to the functionality of the AC cable system, your solar panels um, goes into the solar inverter, which makes AC, and then the battery, which sits over here, has its own um, AC to DC inverter, so it converts energy back from AC into DC into the battery. If you then draw from the battery again, it goes from DC back into IC. In that scenario, you've got um, a bit more losses. However, if you already have uh, a normal solar system and you want to retrofit a battery, then an IC coupled system is probably the easiest way to actually retrofit um, a battery to the existing system. If um, you haven't got solar or battery, I probably would go for a DC coupled system because in a DC coupled system, um, the energy from the solar panels, they um, go, they do go into the inverter essentially, but then the inverter will charge the battery first before it actually goes, uh, before it gets turned into AC energy. That means you don't have to uh, double convert the energy essentially. Um, it will also make it, so it will first supply energy obviously to the household and then charge the battery. But at night, it simply draws from the, the battery into your um, normal grid supply. Um, there's also, as I explained here in the slide, the limitation with, uh, within Queensland and uh, most of Australia actually, which stipulates that you can't have more than 10 kVA of inverter capacity on a single phase. And most, most households not all have single phase. And, um, in that scenario, if we keep that in mind, then a DC cover system would make uh, even more sense because you could have a, a 10 kVA um, hybrid, a battery hybrid inverter, or you could have two 5 kVA inverters, which means overall you would be able to get more solar on your, onto your roof. Um, because in the, it's a DC cover system. With an AC cover system, if you already have a 5 kilowatt system, and you would retrofit, um, for example, a, a Tesla Powerwall or, or something similar, which comes with, it only, with its own inverter, but it's only a battery inverter, that means you can't, you can't actually add more solar panels. And um, in the next graph, I'll go into further, you really want um, a fair chunk of solar panels because you can, while the feed-in tariffs are not that good anymore, you can actually sell energy out of your battery uh, when the grid needs energy to stabilize the grid, which I'll explain in a minute. And um, they pay you a good amount of money as well. Um, before we go into, into that, um, here's just a quick overview of what's in the market. Um, 
it's because I'm getting a Tesla, I'm not biased or so, but the, the Tesla Powerwall is actually pretty good. They got a, a good product with customer service. Um, the Sonnen is a, is a German brand, so it's um, the next one here. Um, the other brand I've seen the market a bit is Enfys. Uh, I haven't seen many of that brands yet. Um, every, uh, every actual battery manufacturer like Duracell or uh, Bauta, they're now trying to make um, home batteries as well. I'm not sure how successful they're going to be, just because there are a lot of brands already in the market. And um, on the right hand side, we see a rough um, uh, a price guide. So they, some brands are obviously a lot more uh, expensive. For example, Enfys, while that's easy to install, it's also quite expensive. Um, Tesla is still on the, on the cheaper end, even though the price here went up recently. What's, um, when you do go out uh, shopping for batteries, what's important as well is that you actually compare the usable energy with usable energy because some uh, manufacturers, they advertise their battery with um, the overall capacity, but then in the terms and conditions, it tells you that you only can take about 90% out of the battery. Some batteries you only meant to discharge uh, to 80%, so you take out 80%. Um, and what, I haven't got it here, but I got a, a spreadsheet where I actually compare the usable energy versus the cost, which gives you the, tr the true cost, because here, um, if we look at, that's um, 100%, and so what each module has 1.2 kilowatt hours at 100%, and if we compare it with that battery, it got uh, 6.5 at 90, so we just need to have a, make the conversion. What's also important to look at is the end of life capacity. So all batteries here give you a technical warranty, but that battery only gives you a warranty uh, which says that the battery will have 60% of its capacity in 10 years. If you compare it with um, a better one here that has ID, 70 ID again, so that does make a difference as well. And you should uh, keep that in mind because the, while lithium is reasonably new, it's also not, not, that, not that new anymore. I do believe that will last 10 years. So. <laughs> Actually, 10, 10 years plus 10 years is the warranty that I give you. You can probably expect to get around 15 years out of it. Uh, on that machine, we got um, DC coupled batteries. LG has been pretty big in the market. However, they also got uh, a recall going on at the moment. Um, the issue with the LG battery is that for years they used as a marketing tool that their the battery is very small and very um, high capacity, so very dense. However, that's also caused an issue because when, when you charge batteries, as you know, it, it expands. And because LG makes the battery really, really dense and didn't keep much room for expansion, they're now having issues where the battery start to oh. yeah, to bolt. And because the heat can't go anywhere and the battery can't actually expand, it could lead to, uh, to really big issues. So they're taking, they're replacing uh, thousands of batteries at the moment. But saying that, like the battery itself is good, every manufacturer, every now and then has has some sort of issues and uh, the important part here is that she actually hangs it quite well they got a complete uh, team just looking after the replacement a big brand in the battery market is also BYD um, they are actually a lot bigger than people in Australia probably know in, uh, in China they own or they, they make a gigantic amount of uh, EVs including buses whole fleets and um, they've been in the market for a very long time and we know what they're doing with batteries. They might not look as pretty, they look a bit more in that way, I guess. But uh, they work quite well, uh, especially that model here 
we use a lot and um, that few models here. Um, the warranty in that range, they're all sitting at around 60%. Um, Sangra is also a very good brand uh, with similar performance to the rest. What's very interesting as well are self-managed lithium batteries. I probably should explain first with lithium batteries, uh, a battery management system. And um, what self-managed batteries do, they have the battery management system built in. That means you can charge them with nearly, nearly every normal uh, MQTT charge or, or off-grid inverter. But if we go back, uh, that DC carry batteries, they need a solar inverter or an off-grid inverter which actually talks to the battery and manages the battery. Where with that battery is here, you can even put in uh, if you got some. They make lithium car batteries as well. It's literally a one for one replacement into your car. Uh, we've used a lot of uh, that two ranges here. Uh, they're actually made in Australia as well. well. I'm trying to use Australian products where I can. Um, but they're, they're very good and reliable. Even uh, we have customers come to us with old off grid systems which can be almost 10 years old as long as the, the charger still works properly and you can change the, um, the volts and the amps on how the charger uh, pumps energy into the battery, they can use lithium batteries as well in the old system because the management of the lithium battery is built into it. That graph, uh, you probably can argue about a lot of figures, but it's just to give you an, an idea. Um, there are diff many different lithium uh, types out there, there are many different type acid uh, batteries out there. Um, there's also flow batteries, which I'll explain in a minute. <coughs> um, the cycle life means how many times can you charge a battery from 0 to 100 over the life of the system, and with lithium, you get um, anywhere between four to eight thousand, depending on the on the chemistry they use. With that acid, you can get between two to probably four and a half, five thousand cycles if you uh, spend a lot of money and you get really good lead acid batteries. Even doesn't matter if you get gel or still the flooded batteries, as long as you take care of lead acid batteries, they are good. But you really need to take care of them and. They don't really like the heat, and um, I know that firsthand because we have a lot of off-grid systems out west uh, towards Emerald, and some of them are actually in air-conditioned containers. However, the, the multiple locations where the air conditioner either was turned off by accident or it just broke, no one cared, and uh, that acid batteries overheat quite quickly, <coughs> and one customer lost lost his whole bank. If you look at uh, lithium batteries, they can actually tolerate heat up to 40, 45 degrees, which is a lot better. They might still slightly reduce the, the intake and output, but um, not by much. It's not noticeable. And um, it's what people think lithium is dangerous and can't overheat and so forth. It's actually pretty safe and works a lot better in, uh, in hot conditions. Um, obviously, lithium you can charge very quick and you can discharge very, very quick as well. Where with lead acid, um, it takes up to, for the same amount of energy to go into a lead acid battery, it can take 10 hours. Um, flow batteries, I haven't got a graph or anything here, but flow batteries work based on a, on a chemical. You basically, in very basic terms, you've got a, a chemical flowing through a membrane. membrane and it's generating electricity that way. It's literally pumping uh, a liquid, a, a chemical from one container into another container flowing through a membrane. And you get a lot of cycles out of it before you actually have to change the chemical. Um, however, the, the drawback is that you do need to discharge a flow battery to 0% every couple of days. 
that means that you actually need to two batteries because if you go off grid, you discharge your battery to zero percent. Yes. That's why I have why I'm not a, big, not a big fan of it. It might work well if you live on grid, but other than that, I wouldn't recommend now batteries. It's also still fairly new. There are a lot of um, stories out there that the chemical breaks down, and then you need to change it before the 10,000 cycles are over. Um, together with um, the DC covered lithium batteries, you need a hybrid inverter which manages the battery. And here we see a, a, a list of uh, battery inverters which are out in the market at the moment. Uh, the Freedios is a Austrian uh brand which has a long uh, history of successful products. Um, so much coming from Israel, Huawei, everyone knows, Sangro uh, is a Chinese product, but they are very, very good. I've been working with them for many years, but I said before I wouldn't buy cheap Chinese products. Uh, Sangro actually is very good. Um, SolarX is also okay, and then we got um, QSets, which is actually uh, an inverter, uh, sorry, a solar panel manufacturer, but they thought they wanted to get into the market of uh, hybrid inverters. I'm not like my feedback on how their product works, um, and that product is not yet in the market. Uh, the range that I come in is um, very similar throughout the brands. What's um, a bit different and what you need to watch out for if you do get one is um, the backup power and the search power. So all of that, sorry, not all, um, except the Huawei inverter here um, and the Solar Edge inverter. Um, the other hybrid inverters actually give you EPS backup as well, EPS for emergency power supply. It is not a UPS. A UPS works technically different to an EPS. What uh, an EPS does, if the grid goes down, it actually has a relay built in and it disconnects the grid and then it starts back up again. A UPS would have uh, a constant, um, essentially two transformers built in and uh, in a backup battery. That means that if the grid drops, there would be no, uh, there would be no power outage at all and UPS. Uh, with EPS, you see anywhere between two seconds to five seconds before the power comes back on. But in most home scenarios, that's it's pretty good. And I mean, how yes, we do have floods, but then you don't have that many power outages in Brisbane, I guess. Um, I personally would be happy if I had the power come back on after two to five seconds, and the neighbor doesn't have any power. Um, what I personally would be looking at is the, the search power because if you obviously um, back up either your whole house or the kitchen and you turn on your kettle in a toaster you can easily get to a couple of kilowatts. Um, something, I mean that is a small inverter, about 2 kVA wouldn't really do much, you could easily trip that quite, uh, quite quickly. Price-wise, um, the Austrian-made product is obviously it is the most excuse me the most expensive one, and then uh, we go down in price if we go into Chinese territory. Here's a quick table of uh, solar inverters which are out in the market at the moment. We got the Austrian inverter, then the Israeli one. Um, SMI, which um, still makes some of the products in, in Germany. Uh, a firma which uh, bought the ABB solar inverter range, they are actually made in Italy. Um, what we got here is Enphase, Enphase are micro inverters, and rather than bringing the DC down from, from the roof, you actually convert it to AC on the roof and you got an AC cable coming down. So essentially, you've got a small inverter underneath each panel, which 
is good if you've got a lot of shading because if one module, if one panel is shaded, the others are not affected because we've literally got an inverter sitting under each individual panel. However, the, the drawback here would be that you got, uh, you got 20 panels, you got 20 inverters, and you got 20 parts of hardware. And we do actually see that happening, unfortunately. While manufacturers uh, tell you it's, it's no issue, it is an issue. It's, if you've got more products in the market, you have more points of failure. So I would only use that if, um, if you really got a lot of shading. Or the other scenario is if you don't want to incorporate and you do not have space to mount an inverter in a, uh, in a common area, you could use end face with small inverters on the roof and you literally just wire into the, the common switchboard that gets around the issue that people might not want to see the, the inverter in the, in the public car park or something. <coughs> uh, that's just as information. Uh, where the market is sitting at the moment with, with battery systems. Um, we actually did see a 20% a, a price increase in, in March, which is due to, again, a high demand, product shortage, chip shortage, it's same as with many other products. Uh, we knew it would be coming for a long time. Um, And the reason for it was actually about 20 to 25 percent of the price increase. Um, if we look at that's the, the battery price graph until about February. Unfortunately, I couldn't find a graph with the March price increase. But if we look, what I did find was the, the lithium price. And if you look at the lithium price, did it literally just skyrocketed in 2020. That's why uh, a lot of shipments went up in price. In general, uh, the solar system prices did come down for a very long time. However, in uh, 21, they basically bottomed out and uh, the prices are going up again. That also got to do with um, high demand, um, raw material shortages um, with cobalt. We got also uh, a freight, obviously. Lithium is mined in, a, uh, in only a few countries around the world, and you do need to ship it mostly to China, where they make the crystals and the cells. Um, Besides that, companies also, solar panel manufacturers also, they, they couldn't reduce the price any further. Some of them went out of business because it's just a price war, and the price had to go out again to keep companies in the business actually. Overall, if you look back uh, to 2018, it's still um, a very good buy at the moment, very good investment. Um, now we're going into a few slides where I explain to you what um, batteries can do and what benefit to the overall network is and how um, it can be financially uh, beneficial to have a battery even if you've already got a solar system. Um, to get started, some of you may have heard the term uh, duck curve, which is um, the graph on the right hand side here. That's um, the energy demand on the network and you see that Obviously, at night, um, there's very little demand, then everyone gets up in the morning, turns on their kettle and uh, the toaster, so um, the demand goes up. However, in the same time, then solar kicks in, and solar um, supplies a lot of energy to the, to the market. And then in the evening, everyone is coming home, hot water systems kick in, the demand goes up again. You can see that uh, that's 2020, that's 2016. So over the years, more and more solar meant there is less and less demand during the day. However, the demand in the morning and in the evening is almost still the same. And that's causing a lot of uh, issues for the network because coal fired uh, power stations, they don't just, uh, they can't be ramped up and down very quickly. They need, um, they don't know exactly how long they need, but they need. 
a fair amount of, uh, of warning to actually increase production and also ramp it down again. So the dark curve is actually pretty bad for the, for the elect electricity grid and it's actually causing the grid to be um, unstable if it happens. Um, if that curve goes further down, that would literally make the, the network uh, unstable. And on the right hand side, we actually see the electricity price on the, on the whole side market as well. And uh, over the years, the, the price actually came down, to be honest. In the evening, we still, in the mornings, it's not that bad anymore, but in the evenings, we still see higher price, and that's where uh, you can actually sell electricity out of your battery if you've got excess storage and then uh, get paid quite well. And um, that's then called when you sell electricity uh, during peak times. Uh, you're actually participating in a VPP, which is a virtual power plant. And um, it's not necessarily just uh, solar batteries in households. VPPs can be made up of uh, wind, uh, hypo storage, or, or any type of, uh, of storage, basically. But um, for us, when we talk about VPPs, we mainly mean um, households which have a solar PV system and, uh, and a battery. And the way it works is that you sign up with uh, one of about 15 um, uh, sorry, uh, retail companies which will be looking like Origin, for example, or HVL. You will have your normal uh, electricity account with them. But they also, you will give them essentially control over your battery. You can, depending on the company and depending on the, on the subscription you go on, you can uh, give them 100% access to your battery or you can only give them 50% access to your battery, meaning that they are only allowed to take 50% of your energy out when they need. And once you're on that, on a VPP um, tariff essentially, what will happen in, um, in the evening, mainly in the evening, um, when the electricity demand, when the demand goes up and um, the price also shoots, uh, shoots up, that's when AGL may remotely activate your battery, they discharge um, for you, a fairly small amount of your battery, but they pay you uh, a good amount of money. They can pay you up to 45 cents for it, which is uh, which is pretty good. Um, better and the payment uh, goes onto your uh, electricity account, and the same as with a normal feed-in tariff. If you've got enough, you can also get um, a payout essentially. What you do need to keep in mind if you're on a VPP, again, you need to you need to uh, work out how much electricity or what percentage of excess you want to give them, because if you if your driving factor for getting a battery system was the EPS and HL, for example, discharges 50% of your energy at 8 a.m. Oh, sorry, at 8 p.m. and then by 10 p.m. there's a blackout. And you only got 50% left, then well, you might not get go through the get through the whole night. You just need to keep that in mind. But then, also, if you always just keep energy in your battery and you, don't, and you don't use it, you don't get any. There's no return investment that you can get. You do need to cycle your battery always need to get a return investment. Um, we see customers which can actually make between 200 to 500 dollars per year just by participating in a VPP. Um, and with a VPP, it's not just about um, making money, and it's also about stabilizing the grid because if the demand shoots up and the coal-fired power station cannot ramp up the production big enough, uh, the, there is actually the risk of the network collapsing, collapsing as well which uh, almost happened, I think, twice last year. And because uh, the big uh, battery banks out there, for example, in, um, in South Australia, we've got a big Tesla installation, and then actually rescued to the network, I think, twice last year. Otherwise, there would have been a massive blackout. And doing that with um, 
thousands and thousands of small residential systems has the same effect, so it actually really helps and stabilizes the grid. Um, here I've got a graph about, uh, which I thought might be interesting to you guys. That's the last um, seven guidelines actually in February, and it shows you the, how we, how Australia is getting the electricity. So, uh, power brown power black power is still a massive amount. Um, and then obviously during the day we see all the solar, and again that's a problem for the for the coal fired power stations because they do need to run down, otherwise there's too much electricity on the network and it's the same has the same effect as it does not enough. Um, that's actually the your VPP, the, the network operator can also tell the battery to charge, which is equally important uh, because if there's too much electricity then it would also um, uh, could collapse. Um, Overall, obviously, hydro and wind is quite stable, so I will change by the guys. Here's the same, the same graph, but that graph is our uh, from 1999, so you see um, how the demand in Australia actually grew, especially in the group uh, by, and we used coal to, uh, actually, black coal to make up for it. And while the, the demand kind of stayed the same, we now got a lot more renewables, I guess. Hydro um, also increased by a fair bit. And um, again, the battery charging and discharging are your residential and commercial um, virtual power plants. Uh, now just a few slides about um, EVs because they are um, obviously coming. Uh, in 2021 we sold uh, about 86,000 EVs. Uh, currently there are 31 different models and they are almost growing by the day. Um, cheap ones are starting at uh, around 40 grand, which are, I think the Nissan Leaf is um, quite good. Um, the uh, 14 of them do cost less than 65 grand. Um, charging stations, I got a map about them as well, they are more and more, and I think as long as you only drive in uh, the, the city or the, around the 200k um, um, radius, you're going to be fine because most EVs will get you around four to 500. Um, kilometers. Um, in, in general, I think Australia is still um, a fair bit behind. Uh, if you compare the figures here on the bottom, we got about 0.78% um, of all cars sold by EVs. In the UK, it was 10, and in Norway, which are the best, well, not the best, but the ones which sell the most, are about 74%. Uh, but then in Australia, obviously, with charging like, from distances, it's not quite that easy, I think. Overall, what might actually work a little bit better in Australia could be um, uh, hydrogen, because hydrogen can actually transport and you can retrofit the gas stations to a degree with, with hydrogen. So for Australia or for big countries, I think hydrogen would be a good, good option as well. The charging network is growing, that's just with the fast chargers. Obviously, you, can, you could literally plug in your car uh, in any normal uh, 10 or 16 amp uh, wall socket as well. Um, the reason why well, I'm currently renting a bit of my Tesla as well, but I did really like the idea of uh, when I do buy a house and I've got a solar system, I literally don't need to go to a gas station. I just plug it in at home and um, I fuel up my car here. It's, especially now with the fuel prices going up, I don't think it can get any, any cheaper. Besides obviously being green, I guess. Um, what's uh, very interesting as well, and someone mentioned it before, um, you can actually use 
the battery, the battery in a lot of DPs as well as storage, and you can actually discharge it as well. So the idea is, and it will probably still take a little while, but the idea is that um, if your workplace or the shopping center or whatever supports it, you go there, you go shopping, you charge your car, and you bring electricity home. And the idea is that the shopping center got solar installed, and you're actually getting green, green energy. But then you bring it home, you plug it into your uh, into your wall socket, and instead of charging it, if you need energy at night, you simply discharge it. And considering that um, some of the cars have between 80, sorry, 60 to 80 kilowatt hours of battery storage on board, and the normal household uses about 22 to 28 kilowatt hours per day, um, that's definitely a feasible option. And um, here as well, it's uh, obviously I got it from a, from a website, but it again like, explains that the importance of batteries on the network because they can stabilize the, the grid and uh, prevent blackouts. Um, John asked me that uh, a while ago about recycling, and it's definitely uh, a, big, a big topic. So the, the way solar PV cells in particular are made, a lot of chemicals involved in it. And um, the chemicals basically ensure that uh, conductivity, and then you also got um, a fair bit of solar on them, obviously. And long story short, they really should not go into landfill. It's really bad. Apart from that, you've got a lot of glass and aluminium, as well as some, some plastic components, which you can recycle. Um, we are a little bit behind in Australia with solar, uh, solar module recycling, but it's mainly, mainly because we are a little bit behind with the whole solar panel movement. In Europe, um, they got, it's a, there are a lot more companies which are actually specializing in the, in the recycling. Uh, in Pristine, we got a company which I like to work with, which is called Substation 23. They do take um, solar panels as long as they are still workable, and they literally take them apart, they take the cells out, and they're making, uh, they work almost like a lot of profit, they're making other bits and pieces out of it, small old chunks and stuff like that, so that's very good. Um, if we have solar modules which are completely uh, screwed and they are high damage or broken in any uh, other way, there is uh, there are three companies here which literally buy them and they design the complete module. Same so, uh, for lithium batteries, with lithium batteries, um, it's a lot bigger problem because there's no proper recycling process of plants uh, available in Australia at the moment. Uh, and also that is being shipped overseas, which is I don't like the idea to be honest, the plants are like, it's a good idea to ship rubbish overseas to get a recycle there. So I do really hope that we want to get a proper recycling plants uh, built in Australia soon. One topic I want to um, uh, explain as well is the uh, system safety and performance. Uh, there are a lot of um, systems out in the market which are often, and we mean often, uh, the solar company who installed it is not, no longer around, so the customer doesn't actually know where to go to. Uh, systems could be um, five, ten years old. Um, a lot of systems are also substandards because you have door markers coming around selling <coughs> rubbish and then it is a PR overnight. Uh, of all, it's about seven other companies which uh, go out of business either I, um, with purpose or just went bankrupt. Um, if you do have a system, you really should uh, should check it or, or have it checked by, by a solar accredited electrician, not just by a normal electrician, because they do need to know what to actually look for. It is about um, the safety, obviously, that you don't get a shock when you touch a carbon on roof, but it's also about the system actually still producing energy because if it doesn't. You might be better off uh, completely replacing it or at least getting fixed. Otherwise, it's, um, even if you have a 40% feeding tariff, while you can't actually increase your system size, 
you do want to get the most uh, most energy out of the system. I mean, if it's only doing 50%, you could do better, I guess. Uh, what you would want to check is also the, the panels, the mounting system, so it doesn't fall to get thrown off the roof of the cyclone. Uh, that your inverter is still working and also that uh, the inverter is grounded properly so you don't, you don't get a shock. Uh, assign to the battery, having a and then again checking uh, on your performance. Uh, that's basically it. I do have uh, some videos we could watch, but uh, maybe we go into a few questions first.